Sonic, the heart of your system. What's up guys, welcome back to another GGF mod video and today I'll be going over the two recent builds I did in the Fantex Shift XT. So first I'm going to cover the black and gold build. I want to go over the things like the aesthetics, I went with the black and gold. I want to go over the screen again. I'll probably just uh, put the footage I put directly the same as in the end of the review video because that video was quite long and I did have a heap of comments in the time that's built is did I go over the screen? So I'll probably throw that uh, directly straight in as I covered all that. I do wanna go over temps again because that was at the end of the review video. I had people uh, asking temps about the 12400F which I used. Something like, could you upgrade that to a 12600K and so on. So I'll go over those temps. Then I'll go over cable lengths a bit more because I did have people ask those again. So it'll be a refresher mainly on this build. I do wanna talk about how I got that gold line over the memory and the CPU block. It was very simple. Then I wanna talk over about this one here. This was the second build I did. And this one got a lot of comments about why going an external radiator solution, mainly because in the second Shift XT build, I wanted to go with the smallest option that the Shift XT can go. Uh, for you guys who aren't familiar with the Shift XT, it does do three sizes. So it's one chassis, but it can do three sizes. It can do this one, which will not allow for anything to go up top. So no fans, no radiator. It'll have a second size which can do uh, 30 mil extra so that'll do 25 or 30 mil thick fans only so you still can't install say an all-in-one cooler or radiator and so on then you can go the third size up which is I think 61 millimeters so that allows you to go with a slim radiator and 25 or 30 millimeter fans which in this one I went with the Fantex T30 fans because they are very good performing fans so I wanted to do the smallest option and then the largest option with the radiator and fans built in so this one I wanted to go down a slightly different route of doing the ultimate system in the smallest form factor that the Shift XT can do and this is it here and I went extremely high-end hardware and that's why I went with an external rad setup and a lot of people did say hey I was cheating this isn't the point of SFF but hey I've done a lot of SFF builds recently uh, in the last probably two years I started off with the Sun Milo tier 3 then I've done the Ghost S1 the Ghost S1 came out really good I still have that built I will probably do a one-year sort of reunion on that whole setup because it's still built as I just said and I want to cover mainly things like temps and how I did it all because I still haven't done a mod video on that one yet. I've also done the Q58 from Lian Lee, that was the purple one, that one was pretty sweet. I've done these two Shift XT builds, I've done the Lian Lee A4 H2O build recently, that was a black and purple one. I've done a Sliger SV590 that I've just released and I'm also doing another A4 H2O build. So I've done plenty of builds and nearly all of those, well this is the only one where I've gone with an external radiator solution. So it wasn't no about, yes I cheated in this uh, build. It was more about doing something different and seeing how much a radiator system like this would affect temperatures in say something like this. Now I purely made, this would be like a mini Moira setup. This is an EKPE 240 with uh, 25 millimeter fans and in saying that an EKPE 240 still will not fit in most uh, SFF cases. Most SFF cases give you about 55 millimeters. Uh, the Shift XT gives you 61 so you can go with a slim and slightly thicker fans but you still can't fit a PE. PE is 38 and then with 25 mil fans uh, that makes it about 63 64 65 millimeters give or take a bit so this is slightly more high-end than what you can fit in a standard SFF build and you still couldn't fit this in this configuration in the shift XT and you will be surprised the temps going from this I've done three uh, test setups I've gone this external from the system so say a meter away I've gone this with the same distance away say on the ground and then I've done this setup actually sitting on top of the case as it would be inside an SFF case where you've got your components then your radiator and fans or fans and radiator where it's normally either blowing straight up or straight down so I tried to uh, simulate that but before I go into all that I do want to quickly go over the original black and gold one this got a lot of attraction and more more than I was surprised, I guess it's just the cleanliness, how the runs are sort of laid out and how it all came together. Now, I do wanna go over temps in this one. I did cover this one earlier. The specs are a 12400F and it is a reference 3080. Now, I do love my reference 3080s as they are very, very short. I would go with 3070s, but they are very, very hard to find those reference cards. Now, I'm not talking about FE cards, I'm talking about uh, uh, reference cards. So things like the uh, Galax SG-1, there's also the XLR8, they do one. So you have to really look at the EK configurator, look at the card that you're after, and if it's a reference one, there'll be like 
10, 15 different type of blocks for it. They'll all be the same block. They'll just be like acetal, they'll be uh, clear plexi, they might be a full nickel and so on. And the reason why I go up those 38 is the references, they are so short. I think they're about 220, and then I can fit a pump res combo at the end. So they're very, very good uh, in these cases. The problem is they do generate just a little bit of heat. Now, when I build an SFF system, I'm not all about uh, putting high end carter in and then undervolting it all. Uh, crazy to get temps within reason. I like to either push my hardware to what its capabilities are or even a little bit further. And that's why in this system, I did run the 5900X in PBO. You might be saying, well, that's unfair, running it in PBO with this rad and running it in PBO, which I did in this radiator here. But hey, if you have a 5950X and you don't run it in PBO, if you're doing uh, multitasking on it, I think the all core stock without PBO is like 3.8, 3.9, it might be lower, but when you enable uh, PBO, you can pretty much get 4.4, 4.5 on all cores, and it does make a big difference. But anyway, jumping back to this one, I will just throw up the temperature results. I'll probably have them up already. I don't want to go over each, uh, each one like I did for each test in the uh, review video, because that did go on quite a bit. But as you can see, temperatures overall are pretty good. Now, in these SFF builds, I found a trend. You either do uh, synthetic tests, uh, where you're either testing the CPU only, and then the GPU only, and then you do gaming tests. I found out, find out in an SFF system, doing a synthetic test isn't enough to test out the overall performance. Because you're limited on radiator setup, you might find that a synthetic test is enough to handle the radiator that's inside it all, and saying that the radiator is enough to handle the one synthetic test or the one piece of hardware you're testing. So say Cinebench R20, you're just gonna be smashing the CPU and a system like this and this CPU, it's a very, very, I wouldn't say very low end, but I think it's capped at like 75 watt. So this radiator can easily handle, a slim radiator can easily handle 75 watts. You might be saying, sweet, that's good. Then you move on to the GPU, what's a 3080? Say 300 watts. That's about the limit for this system. So when you move down to 3D Mark Time Spike, yes, it's running at about 71 degrees. Then when you move over to a game, you are kind of combining them uh, both. If you're doing 4K, probably less on the CPU, but I have found that gaming tests in these small uh, systems do cause the most heat. They're doing the most heat soak. They got your CPU working and your GPU working. And that's what I found out in this system when running them both together. That's what really destroys it in the smaller radiator setup. But yeah, as you can see, temps on this are pretty reasonable. Going with the 12600K, I'll probably say it, it is feasible. Um, if you're not doing anything that's too CPU intensive, because as you can see, uh, Overwatch, uh, these are about 40 minutes of gameplay, 45 minutes of gameplay. Uh, the CPU is at 62 degrees. Now you have to bear in mind, if you throw in, I think a 12600K is 110 watts, so you've got 75 watts to 110, so you're throwing in about another 35, 35 to 40 watts. So you're not just increasing the CPU temp there, you're also going to be increasing the memory and the GPU uh, memory and the GPU as well because they are in the same loop so the CPU will be being uh, heated up as well So I think those temps are definitely uh, within reason I wouldn't throw anything like a 3090 or a uh, 12900K because the difference between a 12600K uh, If you look at the gamers Nexus video his temps were about uh, 70 degrees max I think it was an air cooler or an all-in-one cooler then when you go to 12900 It's like another 20 degrees above that. It's like 90 degrees So definitely stay away from those higher-end systems in these SFF uh, PCs now that's uh, pretty much on that. 12600K, you could possibly get away with it. I think it would be fine. Now looking at the black and gold aesthetics, this was a tricky one with this one. It was the first time I've done gold in a long time. I know EK just recently did their gold series, so I really wanted to go with the gold, but I didn't know how I should implement it. And I think I did get it just about right. I didn't want to go too much gold. I was thinking about doing the gold as in every fitting gold. So the extensions, the 90s, the end fittings, the stop fittings in gold, but I do think now that might've been a little bit too much. So I ended up toning it down a bit. I just went with uh, standard classic 90s from EK. So they're all the black ones. Any extensions, anything that wasn't an end fitting or a stop fitting, I went black. And then I only went gold with the stop fittings and then the end fittings. And that was pretty much it. The micro torques, I don't think were out or they just came out. So I didn't have them, but on the new uh, Lian Li A4 H2O build I just did, I went with the micro torque, and I would highly suggest them if you are going with a system like this. They just work really good. They are super small, and you can actually turn them with an Allen key. So if you've got a tight area and you can't get your fingers in, you can get an Allen key to turn them. It doesn't turn the actual 90, but it will turn the rotary thread into where you need to screw them into, and they just work really well that way. 
Uh, another thing with the getting the, it's actually facing the wrong way, I'll get some B-roll shots, getting that gold line to continue over the memory onto the uh, CPU block, it was very, very last minute. I actually was always going to do the CPU block. Uh, this is the Velocity 2, uh, it is the full acetyl. Now it does have that RGB line, I simply took a very high res photo. I do have a vinyl cutter. So with that high res photo, the vinyl cutter all basically traces around it. So I got that high, high res uh, photo traced around that actual little uh, RGB line. It wasn't on at the time. I just took it where you could see the white sort of opal look. Made a replica in that in the uh, vinyl printing software and just printed it out in gold vinyl and stuck it on top and then when i was actually doing the build i thought hey it'd be pretty cool if it ran over the memory so then i just cut out the same bit of uh, gold again the same thickness just some long lengths and ran them over the uh, dim slots or the dim sticks now in terms of the memory in this system a lot of people did ask as well this is just standard uh, ddr5 it is the hyperx fury but i didn't like how those heat spreaders looked so i just grabbed some random uh, water block heat spreaders I had. Now you can go EK. I think these ones in here are Bixky. These are just the sides of the ram sticks that you put on. And then I haven't gone with the top of the block because you definitely know, don't need it. And I just wanted that nice clean aesthetics that tied this whole system up nicely. So keep that in mind. If you don't like your uh, heat spreaders that come on your memory sticks, you can remove them. You've got to be very, very careful because you can actually pull off your chips uh, the ICs off your memory. If you're uncareful, you do need like a heat gun or I use like a hairdryer, something that's not too hot, just enough to warm it up. And you've got to sort of go sideways to pry it off. Never just sort of rip it off straight away, get a screwdriver under it, because you definitely will damage it. So yeah, that's pretty much on that system. Cable lengths I do want to cover again. The 24 pin, I went with the 25 uh, millimeters long. The EPS is 410. I only went with 410 on the EPS because they're always the furthest away. You've got your PSU over this side, and so uh, PCU over this side, the EPS down this bottom corner. I don't just run it along the chassis. I normally go behind the motherboard and run it along that way. The GPU is about 250 millimeters because it's basically uh, straight over here and it loops over to the GPU. And once again, I did use the cable mod SFF cables. Now these aren't the sleeve cables. They are SFF and they don't have the sleeve. It makes the outer casing very, very thin while, while keeping the same diameter of the actual uh, wire the same. And they do work really good in these builds. Moving on to the screen. Now, if this isn't too bad, I will bear in mind you are going to have to drill into your case. I'll show you all of this on film. But to do that, you actually have to pop the cover off, which I did mention. I did mention, I won't be able to do it on that one, but I did mention earlier, once you go up to show the IO, you pop it up once more, then you can get to the four screws and then there's one right at the top. Once the whole panel comes off, you just drop it down. Then you get access to four screws at the back that holds the uh, inner curved mirror bit in. But then you can also detach the mirror on the front, that is glass. There's some little clips. Once you pop that off, you have pretty much access to the guts of the inside of that infinity mirror. Now there's some RGB strips either side. All of this is removable. They're all removable by cables and connectors. You can pretty much gut that all out till you just have one big square in the front. Now that square comes to roughly 130 millimeters wide by 80 millimeters high and the depth you have for a screen is a maximum to five to six millimeters. I wouldn't go any thicker than that for a screen. I'll put a link to the screen that I used and it just fit in there perfectly. The ones I use are very, very thin and they are AMOLED. They do cost a bit, they'll be about 150 so dollars. Pretty much basically the price of the case but I use them in a lot of builds so I do get my use out of them. Then I basically drilled a hole because the screens are basically made up of the screen then there's a ribbon cable that goes to a little daughter board. Then that daughter board goes to another ribbon cable, which is a larger daughter board. And that board has the HDMI, USB power, and so on. So there's no way you're gonna be able to jam that in the front. You basically have to drill a hole. I lined it up so it went exactly into that gap between the power supply and the center frame of the case. Once I did that, I was able to nicely fold it all up in there. So I just had the last daughter board that has the HDMI and then the USB uh, power in that gap and then I just ran the HDMI out the bottom. I use ribbon HDMI cables. Uh, they're very thin and that just runs along the bottom. And then I ran USB which goes up behind the GPU and back into the uh, back into the motherboard. So that's 
probably the best way to do it and to run the display with the round uh, gauges on, I do use AquaSuite. You can use a lot of things, A to 64, you can e even use NZXT Cam, but I do like the AquaSuite setup because you can customize it really well. And I just went with something simple, uh, the two little gauges either side, and then I did a split gauge in the front that had the uh, CPU clock and then the GPU clock. So that worked well, but I will show, uh, I will throw the screen that I used in the description down below. Now, moving on to this setup here. Okay, so what I talked about before was the different type of radiator setup. So the video had this one here, and a lot of people, I'm not sure if they were confused, or they kind of said, what's the point of going SFF if you have to lug this massive radiator around? Now, I'm sure a lot of people who do build their SFF systems, they do take it with them wherever they go, but then you're also gonna have a lot of people who just like the nice, clean desk setup. They like that minimal setup, and there's no reason why you can't throw this on the ground out of the way and then you've got the small system over here. I even saw someone post their setup where they had one of these radiators strapped to their uh, electronic uh, lift stand desk where it goes up and down, and that was strapped to the side of the leg, and that also went up and down with the PC as well, which was pretty cool. And then I've even seen people put these in separate rooms. If you have like a concrete house and it backs into like a, a dedicated room or like a laneway or something in the back, you can put it in there and it makes it completely silent and completely cool, out of sight, and then you've just got this system on the desk. So there's plenty of reasons you can go with this setup. It's not just because, hey, I was lazy, I couldn't water cool it inside, I wanted to go with this setup, but no, I just wanted to go with something different to see how it would go and see how it would perform, because the specs on this system are quite insane. They're 5950X and a 6900 XT. I probably would have gone a 3090, but I didn't have a spare 3090 on hand. And in terms of fitting a 3090 with an active backplate, in these sandwich styles cases are near impossible because you just don't have to have the room. You could possibly be doing it by, if it's a three slot SFF case, you could move it one slot over. You would have to extend the riser cable out more that one slot and then you could fit it behind. So that's something that could be done. Now moving to this radiator setup. So the first one is the Mora with the uh, for Noctua 200s, and yes, Noctua do do a 200s, and a lot of those people who are interested in that fan splitter, Watercool do do a prototype, so Watercool Heat Killer, do a prototype fan splitter, it's in the very, very center there, and that connects all the uh, four fans, and then it just runs straight out the back. And a lot of people were asking me how I powered this unit, because I actually didn't want to run anything down the cables into the PC. First, I was going to do something like a mini XLR or just standard XLR, four pin XLR. I was going to wire it so you've got, uh, two of them would be your power, your plus 12 or your plus five, and then your ground, and then two would be your PWM for your fan signal, and then I would run that down the cable, and then you, ha you would have an XLR socket on this end, and then an XLR socket on this end. But I decided to change it because I went with the Next or D5 Next uh, pump, so that is a fully controlled pump system. You can plug your fans into the back of there. It's got a little screen on there, so I'm not sending any PWM signal back to the system. I've got these fans running at full ball, and you don't really notice the sound of these at all once it's on the ground. They're only 800 RPM. They're very quiet, but I can also turn it down via the little screen on the pump here. And then this pump is powered by SATA, so instead of running SATA all the way back to the system, in here, I just ran a AC to DC little power pack, and then I converted that, which came in as Molex, I converted that, that to SATA. So it goes to AC to DC, and then a SATA plug, which pumps on the back. So the only wire I have coming out of this is on the back here, there is a little DC power pack that takes just a standard IEC, uh, 240 volt power cable, and that just plugs into your wall socket, and that's it. So nothing else. You just have to be careful that when the system is like this, you don't accidentally plug this in, because if you don't have this connected to your system, you aren't making a full loop, something is going to pop off. It's probably not gonna pop off the uh, compression fittings here, because these are super tight. It's probably just gonna blow off this hard tube, and that's the reason why I did install this hard tube line here, mainly because if someone did accidentally plug this in and power was on, you'd probably just shoot off one of these uh, connectors here and it'll just flow out. I was going to put like a pressure valve on, but I didn't have any. So that's really the only way to go about that. You just gotta make sure that if you are transporting it and you put it on a table, you gotta make sure 100% this is fully connected, it's making one loop, or you could always just store it with a, if you do store it, you could make these reverse. So when you do store it, uh, these two go into each other, and then these two can go into each other. We well, don't need to connect these because these aren't powered. But yeah, you, you could reverse these. I made these both the same because I wanted the smaller ends on the PC. Where you could reverse these and have one male, one female, and then one male, one female. So then when you store it, you connect these together. And then if someone accidentally does turn this on, it's just gonna flow in and create the full loop, and then you won't have an issue 
of blowing a fitting off somewhere and coolant going everywhere. So yeah, so that was this Mora setup. Then I wanted to kind of prove a point because the people on the YouTube video were saying, hey, well, I've run similar hardware like this. I run a 5900X. It is a little bit uh, lower end in power. And then they've run a high 6900X or so, and they've run a 240 setup in their small SFF case, and they say temps are fine. Um, they always just say temps are fine. They never come back to say what their temps are, but I created a mini Mora setup. As I said, this is a PE, uh, PE240, which is EK120 more fans. It's got the same Next D5 Next pump in there, and then it's got an FLT, so this is a D5. Now, I do want to go over the temps in this system here. So we'll start off with uh, Cinebench R20. Now, as I said before, if you've got a decent radiator setup in your system that's enough to power one of the components, so say your CPU, the temperature won't be that different. So as you can see, with the Mora setup, the CPU, so this is with uh, PBO on, set to manual, set to motherboard settings. I haven't done too much tweaking in terms of that. Now the power draw was pretty insane. You're looking at 260 watts uh, CPU draw. So you're looking at 77.8 for the Mora. Now that's kind of warm. But we're getting to the stage now where we're limited by the CPU block because you're smashing so much heat through that. You could probably add six more radiators in the system and we're not gonna get it really any cooler than that. We've got our ambient temp, we've got the limitations of the CPU block. So the Mora is doing a decent job for what it can do. Then when we slap on the 240 PE, uh, this was external, so say one meter away, it was at 86 degrees. So I would say thermal wise, the 240 PE can handle the 260 watts of the CPU power draw, that was fine. Then we're moving the 240PE on top. It is a bit ghetto. I did have uh, tape holding it all on and I had to have it on a slight angle because if, if it was sitting flat, the pump was getting too much air. So it was my best simulation I could as in terms of if you had your rad and fan set up like this in the system and the heat soak was coming up from the components into your radiator and fan setup like it would normally do on an SFF build. And then in that setup, it was 89 degrees on Cinebench R20 and this was for about 45 minute run and my room temperature is normally about 25 degrees or so. so as you can see, there's not much difference, 77.8 to 89 degrees. We've gone from two fans, two small fans, to four um, whacking huge fans and the cost setup between this to this is quite different. So we've still got the two D5s, got two extra fans, much more expensive fans, and then we've got the Mora setup, which I think is about 400 or so Australian dollars, where you're looking at 240 PE, it's probably under 100 Australian dollars. So you might be thinking, hey, that's not much difference there. But when you look over to gameplay, I did cover the gameplay in the time that's built for this one here, but I'll go over it, over it again. I did do it a little bit more fine tuning. Whenever I do uh, gameplay in my time that's built, I don't really spend too much time. I spent a bit more time on this and got the temps narrowed down a bit more finer. So the water temp with the Mora in gameplay, this is 30 minutes of Overwatch, 1440p. Now Overwatch isn't a very demanding game, I would say. Now water temp was 34 degrees, that's pretty cool. Now GPU memory was at 52.9. Yep, that's kind of hot on these cars, but we do know that. The GPU itself was uh, 41, so that wasn't too bad. That's I would say that's very cool. That's about the best you're gonna get in a decent uh, water-cooled system. And then the CPU was 60 degrees. So that wasn't too bad. Now we've got the, the contribution of the CPU as well. That was doing about 110, 120 watts. And now we've got the GPU, which was doing about 300 to 350. So we're close up to 400, 450, nearly 500 watts of power going or cooling needed for the system. Now this is where this starts to struggle. With the 240 PE external, so a meter away, plugged in, plugged in with the quick disconnects, Water temp was now 42. That's getting a bit warm. Now bear in mind, this is 30 minutes of gameplay. So GPU memory was now 70.2. Uh, 70 the GPU was at 63, and then the CPU was 81. So the biggest sufferer was the CPU in this game. I'm sure if you ran, uh, ran this game at 4K, it would be less on the CPU, but I wanted to try and do a medium between 1080 and 4K to see how this would go. So now we're getting quite a bit of heat soak, and now just bear in mind, this is only after 30 minutes of gameplay. No one builds a gaming system to play uh, for 30 minutes. Now, in saying that, this wouldn't be entirely a gaming system. This would be more editing and so on. But in saying that, hey, who's not gonna game on a system like this? Now with the 240PE setup on top of the chassis, now we're getting no fresh air from externally. We're getting only cooling coming from within this uh, chassis. Water temp is now 47, nearly hitting 50. GPU memory was at 80. GPU itself was at 73. Now this GPU is stock, the 6900 XT, that is a reference one. 
now our CPU was 89.5. Now 89.5 is nearly getting close to uh, thermal throttling on a 5950X. So this is just in one game Overwatch. I wanted to set this example to show you that as a stock setup with this GPU, although I do have PBO, it's up to you whether you want to run PBO, but hey, if I had a high-end system like this, it was for editing and gaming, I'd probably want to run PBO most of the time. But yeah, this is just a perfect example to show you where um, how a radiator is going to be enough and where it's not going to be enough. So I would say a system like this is probably good for, I would say, 250, 300 watts. Anything more where this system would definitely be needed, 500, something more. And for example, if you're running a high-end system that's running uh, 2390s, although something in SLI wouldn't be utilizing those, or even just a high-end 3090 overclocked, a high-end i9 overclocked, you're going to need something with this size radiator space or a couple of 360s or 2480s would be perfect. So I just wanted to get this out of the way just to show you this example, because a lot of people were saying, uh, do you need such a setup like this? I would think a decent 360 would help, uh, especially in the setup between uh, running the, the radiator external as to on top. It was really on top of the system that killed the temperatures. And that's the problem with a lot of SFF cases. You just can't get enough cool air into your hardware and especially on those fans. And then it comes down to when you build an SFF system, do you want the fans to blow straight down or do you want to blow the fans sucking in and out the top? It's really hard for this system. I actually had the fans blowing out the top as there's quite a lot of uh, gaps and ventilation around here. I've decided to get the hot air out as fast as possible. So it's sucking in the sides and out the top. I guess being kind of large like this, you could go straight down, but then again, you're gonna have a lot of warm air just hanging around all your components and so on. But it's really kind of trial and error to see which is the best type of setup for the case that you've gone down with. But um, anyway, I think that's it for this. It is very rushed, but I did want to get this out, of, out there and show you what a mini uh, more a setup would be like this would be perfect if, if you were taking this to lands or you wanted a portable system You could definitely make do with this. You could take this with you. Uh, you could turn uh, SMT off so you could run half the turn the core half the cores off and this system would probably be good if you're going to a LAN. Uh, you're not gonna sit it on top when you're at a LAN. You could sit it out of the way. And this would be fine if you're at gaming at mate's place. You don't have to lug this every time. But I just did wanna prove that point with running something with a smaller radiator setup with these high-end components. But um, I think that's it on the Shift XT coverage. I've done the two builds. I've done the review and then this mod video about how these two builds came apart. And I don't think I will cover probably these two cases for a very long time unless they release something new or something cool. But anyway, I want to thank Fantex for sending these out. I want to thank you for watching and stay tuned for next time.